Shalom. Uh, welcome. I'm Rabbi Scott with Beth Yeshua Messianic Synagogue in Fort Myers, Florida. We are reissuing the Revelation series that was taught by Rabbi Jim Pickens here at Beth Yeshua over the course of the last two years or so. We feel these messages are especially relevant in these tumultuous times, and we hope and pray that Adonai uses them uh, to strengthen you uh, and, and to encourage you. If you are currently a supporter of this ministry, we would like to say thank you. We appreciate your partnership with us as we all labor together in the work of the gospel of Yeshua uh, in the kingdom here on earth. Uh, if you would like to support us, you will find a link uh, below in uh, the video description. Once again, uh, we hope uh, that this is a blessing to you. If you have any questions, you will find an email address. Uh, if you have any dialogue or discussion, you'll find an email address in the video description below. Please reach out to us. We'd love to hear from you. And uh, now uh, I will give you the Revelation series with Rabbi Jim Pickens. Shalom. Well, good evening, everybody. Good to see everybody out this evening. If you remember, we didn't quite complete chapter 14 last time. So we want to pick up where we left off in the discussion of harvesting the earth. So let's begin by starting with those passages and adding a couple here. Revelation 14, please, beginning in verse 14. It says, Then I looked. And there before me was a white cloud, setting on the cloud was someone like a son of man with a gold crown on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. Another angel came out of the temple and shouted to the one setting on the cloud, Start using your sickle to reap, because the time to reap has come. The earth's harvest is ripe. The one setting on the cloud swung his sickle over the earth, and the earth was harvested. Another angel came out of the temple in heaven. He too had a sharp sickle. Then out of from the altar went yet another angel who was in charge of the fire, and he called in a loud voice to the one with the sharp sickle, Use your sickle and gather the clusters of grapes from the earth's vine because they're ripe. The angel swung his sickle down over the earth, gathered the earth's grapes, and threw them into the great wine press of God's fury. The wine press was trodden outside the city, and blood flowed from the wine press as high as the horse's bridles for 200 miles. Remember that there are two distinct things happening here, one involving those that are sealed to God and Messiah, one involving those who have taken the mark of the beast. In the first, the people who are still living at this time that have chosen to stay with God, to tough it out with God and Messiah, who refuse the mark of the beast are harvested from the earth by Messiah. We know this will be a difficult period from uh, Revelation 13, 7, if you would please. It was allowed to make war on God's holy people and to defeat them and was given authority over every tribe, people, language, and nation. This is talking about the false Messiah. This doesn't mean that all the saints will be defeated only that this defeat will be allowed. Some will fall away, but others will persist with God and with Messiah, and these are the ones that will be harvested by Messiah himself. We need to note the difference between the first group who are harvested. To be harvested is to be placed in the planter's storehouse for safekeeping. So we need to know the difference between the first group who are harvested and the second group who are not harvested but gathered. There's a difference here that's significant. The difference between harvested, being harvested, and being gathered is not a new theme. Yeshua used it in the parable of the wheat and the weeds that we looked at briefly last week. Let's go to Matthew uh, chapter 13, verse 24. Yeshua put before them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. While people were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat, then went away. 
When the wheat sprouted and formed heads of grain, the weeds also appeared. The owner's servants came to him and said, Sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Where have the weeds come from? He answered, An enemy has done this. The servants asked him, Then do you want us to go and pull them up? But he said, No, because if you pull up the weeds, you might uproot some of the wheat at the same time. Let them both grow together until the harvest, and at harvest time I will tell the reapers to collect the weeds first, and tie them in bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn. Now that parable, as you well know, has to do with the ultimate end-time harvesting of the world, where we're going to have Messiah is going to take the good to himself, and the bad are going to be tossed into that place where fire seems to keep burning. Note that the wheat is preserved, taken into the storehouse for safekeeping at harvest time, but notice the weeds which are taken first here. Note that the weeds, the bad elements are taken first here, are not harvested, but collected and bound. They're to be burned. Only the good crop is harvested and placed in safekeeping. This parable actually has a more direct application to Revelation chapter 20, verses 7 through 10, if I could have that up, please. When the thousand years are over, the adversary will be set free from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them for the battle. Their number is countless as the sand on the seashore and they come up over the breadth of the land and surrounded the camp of God's people in the city he loves. But fire came down from heaven and consumed them. The adversary who had deceived them was hurled into the lake of fire and sulfur, where the beast and the false prophet are, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. We're going to look at that really in great depth in just a few weeks. But what I wanted us to see from the passage in Matthew was the theme of the harvest as applied to those sealed to God. And the idea of being collected or gathered for destruction for those who have chosen the mark of the beast is not new for Revelation chapter 14. Yeshua warned the world about this some 2,000 years ago. It is always the same as it will be in tribulation. In essence, the choice at Yeshua's time, or today, really boils down to people deciding who they will serve. It really boils down to people deciding who they will serve, whose seal that they will take for themselves. So, in fact, those who bear the mark of the beast will be gathered and thrown into the metaphoric wine press of God's fury. They'll be physically crushed beyond resignation. And the amount of blood, Revelation 14.20, that is described as flowing here is phenomenal. How high is a horse's bridle? Well, five to six feet depending upon the horse. And I don't think that in this kind of situation that the horse's heads will be down. They will be elevated. Blood from this crushing would be, it says, five to six feet deep for 200 miles. And the implication here is for 200 miles in each and every direction. But note something. This will not be taking place in Jerusalem. This will not be taking place in Jerusalem. This says it will take place outside the city. Now, let's not get wishy-washy about the city. Do we really think this is Chicago or someplace else besides Jerusalem? We're talking about a specific place with specific things laid out for it. So why outside the city? Because inside the city, on the Temple Mount, are most likely Yeshua and the 144,000 first fruits of the harvest that is to come. Those are the ones that follow Yeshua everywhere. We can't actually put them there by scripture reference, but this seems likely. It's even possible that the rest of the harvest those that follow, would be in Jerusalem itself by this time, or perhaps they're in the cloud that's over Jerusalem and the Temple Mount, like a hoopah, like a hoopah, as described in Isaiah chapter 4. 
We'll look at those whose harvest follows 144,000 fruits in, in a few minutes, chapter 15. Now, there's some precedence for God isolating his people from his plagues of judgment. In the plagues of Egypt, for instance, when certain plagues fell on Egypt, they didn't fall on the land of Goshen within Egypt, where God's people were assembled. Let's go to Exodus uh, 8.22, please. But I will set apart the land of Goshen where my people live. No swarms of insects will be there so that you can realize that I am Adonai right here in the land. Take that to Exodus 9, 4, please. But Adonai will distinguish between Egypt's and Israel's livestock. Nothing belonging to the people of Israel will die. So where were the cattle of God's people? Isolated in Goshen along with them. Exodus 9.26, please. But in the land of Goshen, where the people of Israel are, there was no hail. The picture that we need to take away from all of this is about our God isolating his set-aside people from his judgment that's falling around them. Nothing that fell on Egypt that was bad fell in the land of Goshen on God's people. We know that the people of God who are taken will rule Messiah through the thousand years from Jerusalem. We know that the blood from the crushing of those who have chosen to serve Satan and the false Messiah will be confined to outside the city. A last thought I want to leave you with on this is, in my opinion, this crushing of those who have accepted the mark of the beast is the first act, the first act of rule of Messiah over the world. This is the first act of rule of Messiah over the world. Looking ahead again, Revelation 19, verse 11. Next I saw heaven opened, and there before me was a white horse. Sitting on it was one called Faithful and True. It was in righteousness that he passes judgment and goes to battle. His eyes were like a fiery flame, and on his head were many royal crowns. And he had a name written which no one knew but himself. He was wearing a robe that had been soaked in blood, and the name by which he was called is the Word of God. The armies of heaven clothed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses, and out of his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down nations. He will rule them with an iron staff. It is he who treads the winepress from which flows the wine of the furious rage of Adonai, God of heaven's armies. And on his robe and on his thigh, he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Do we see how that comports with what we've seen in chapter 14 concerning the winepress of God's fury and Babylon the Great falling, who made the nations drink the wine of God's fury because of her whoring around? It's Messiah who treads this wine press at the time when he returns to rule with an iron staff. And I want to look at a little more information about this. So Zechariah 14, please. 2. For I will gather all nations against Jerusalem for war. The city will be taken. The houses will be rifled and the women raped and half the city will go into exile. But the rest of the people will not be cut off from the city. Then Anna and I will go out and fight against those nations, fighting as on the day of battle. On that day his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which lies to the east of Jerusalem, and the Mount of Olives will be split in half from east to west to make a huge valley. Half of the mountain will move toward the north and half of it towards the south. You will flee to the valley and the mountains, for the valley and the mountains will reach at Zell. You will flee just as you fled before the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. Then Adonai, my God, will come to you with all the holy ones. In verse 2, in verse 2, we're shown the end of the trampling down of Jerusalem by the Goyim. Half the city will go into exile, it says. I think this represents the, trend, the Goyim, the, the Gentiles that were ruling the city, all being taken out, thrown out of the city. Now, consider for a moment that Jerusalem is the center of worship 
of the God of Israel, both by Jews, most of them non-believing in Yeshua, and a fair segment of Christianity, but not all of them. There's Rome and there's other aspects. Plus, it is a worship center for Islam, and by the time we get to the end of the age, will have been a worship center for the false messiah. That half the city that remains after it's purged, half the city will not be cut off, tells us that a huge number of non-believing people will have come aboard the Messianic movement. I believe that. That half the city remains after it is purged, half the city will not be cut off, tells us that a huge number of non-believing people will have come on board the Messianic movement in these last few days and weeks, perhaps months. The two witnesses, I think, will play a huge part in this. This speaks of the very end of the Gentiles over Jerusalem. At this time, Messiah will go forth. His foot will step down on the Mount of Olives, that is, to the east of the Temple Mount, Let's, let's hold our places here for just a minute, and let, let me give you a little something. This is, I'm going to give you, is going to be a review drill for most of you, but write this series of scriptures down so you can have reference to them when you're talking to people about this. Commit these to memory, if you will. Start where we started back in the beginning in, in Revelation 14. Follow that with Revelation 19. Then come here to Zechariah 14. Now, let's go on to Isaiah 4, 2 through 6. On that day, Adonai's plant will be beautiful and glorious, and the fruit of the land will be the pride and splendor of Israel's survivors. Those left in Zion and remaining in Jerusalem will be called holy, and everyone in Jerusalem written down for life. When Adonai washes away the filth of the woman of Zion and cleanses Jerusalem from the blood shed in it with a blast of searing judgment, Adonai will create over the whole side of Mount Zion and over those who assemble there a smoking cloud by day, a shining flaming fire by night, for the glory will be over everything like a chupa. A sukkah will give shade by day from the heat. It will also provide refuge and cover from storm and rain. When Messiah steps down on the Mount of Olives, this cloud that's being described here is what he's stepping down out of. It's going to have come down out of heaven, come down directly just above Jerusalem, and he's going to step down out of that onto the Mount of Olives. Do we all remember Acts chapter 1, verses 9 through 11? Yeshua, who is leaving his Talmudim behind and going away, ascends into a cloud which hides him from the view of the Talmudim, the disciples, who are then told at that time that this is the way that Yeshua will return in that same cloud. We won't spend a lot of time on this since we've studied this pretty thoroughly before. The chupa represents the marriage of the bridegroom to the bride. That takes place under what's called a hoop, or usually it's a very large talit that's stretched over a couple of frames and everything. The hoopa represents the marriage of the bridegroom to the bride. The sukkah is a temporary structure. When you mention sukkah, it's always some kind of a temporary structure which ties to the millennial reign of Messiah, which is a temporary structure. So let's go to Ezekiel, chapter 43, verses 1 through 4. After this he brought me to the gate facing east. There I saw the glory of the God of Israel approaching from the east. His voice was like the sound of rushing water. Note that, his voice being like the sound of rushing water here in Ezekiel 43. We're going to see that same phrase in many places throughout Scripture. His voice was like the sound of rushing water, and the earth shone with his glory. The vision seemed like the vision that I had seen when I came to destroy the city. Also, the visions were like the vision I had seen by the Kavar River, and I fell on my face. 
This is Ezekiel speaking. Adonai's glory entered the house from the gate facing east. Well, he has come back in the cloud just as was promised us. Just keep that in mind. He's come back in the cloud just as was promised us. Which is hanging out there at his return over all of Zion like a hoopa, like a covering across there. And like a sukkah, it creates a structure, if you will. And he stepped down on the Mount of Olives from where he ascended, which has been split in half. The Mount of Olives is east of the Temple Mount, and now he enters the Temple through the gate facing east. And give me Zechariah 14.5. Then Adonai, my God, will come to you with all the holy ones. He comes with all the holy ones. Back in Revelation 14, 1 through 4, if you will. Then I looked, and there was the Lamb standing on Mount Zion, and with him were 144,000 who had his name, his father's name, written on their foreheads. I heard a sound from heaven, like the sound of rushing waters, and like the sound of pealing thunder. The sound I heard was also like that of a harpist playing their harps. They were singing a new song before the throne and before the four living beings and the elders. And no one could learn the song except the 144,000 who had been ransomed from the world. These are the ones who have not defiled themselves with women for their virgins. They follow the Lamb wherever He goes. They have been ransomed from among humanity as first fruits for God and the Lamb. With Him, Yeshua, comes the first fruit of the harvest to come. They're introduced in chapter 7 between the seal judgments and the shofar judgments. We've looked at that. And they are soon to be joined by the harvest that follows, in my opinion, before the wine press is trodden down, which I think are the bold judgments we're going to get into next. That was kind of complex and rapid fire that I laid on you just now. We went through an awful lot of material awfully quickly, but it was review. It was review largely from last week and from things that had happened over the past several weeks. But if we follow through these passages just given, we really do see the picture of the return of Messiah. There are other passages that fit into this and give us a fuller picture if we care to research them for ourselves. Okay. That winds up Revelation chapter 14, so let's move on to Revelation chapter 15 and verse 1, please. Then I saw another sign in heaven, a great and wonderful one, seven angels with seven plagues that are the final ones. Because of them, God's fury is finished. Let's read that again. Then I saw another sign in heaven, a great and wonderful one, Seven angels with the seven plagues that are the final ones, because with them God's fury is finished. It's talking about the final plagues that are poured out on those who have elected to follow the false Messiah into the worship of the adversary. And this is a wonderful sign because with the end of these plagues, this is the end of God's fury. When these are done, that's the end of God's fury. The thousand years of peace will then descend on the earth under Messiah's rule. That's what makes this a wonderful sign. But it's anything but a wonderful sign for those pagans that have been left on the earth. These final plagues are the wine press of God's wrath, which we have seen is applied by Messiah as the first thing of his reign. He wipes out the evil that has held the world in his control and those that have followed that evil. Revelation 15, 2, please. I saw what looked like a sea of glass mixed with fire. Those defeating the beast, its image and the number of its name were standing by the sea of glass 
holding harps which God had given them. So just where is this sea of glass mixed with fire? Well, remember that cloud that's now settled down over Mount Zion? If we look in Ezekiel chapter 1, we're given a glimpse as to what it looks like inside that cloud. And remember, from this point on in time, from this point on in time, the physical and spiritual have been more or less merged. They are not held out completely separately. What's going on in the physical is now going on in the spirit world. So let's see what's inside the cloud, see what the inside of the cloud looks like in part. Let's go to Ezekiel chapter 1, verse 22, please, 22 through 28. Over the heads of the living creatures was what appeared to be a dome glittering like ice. It was awesome, spread out over their heads, above them. Under the dome, each had a pair of wings spread out straight towards those of others. Each had a pair which covered his body. I heard the sound of their wings when they moved it. It was like the sound of rushing water, like the voice of Shaddai, like the noise of a tumultuous crowd or army. When they stopped, they lowered their wings. Whenever there was a sound from above the dome over their heads, they stopped and lowered their wings. Above the dome that was over their heads was something like a throne that looked like a sapphire. On it, above it, was what appeared to be a person. And I saw what looked like gleaming amber-colored fire radiating from what appeared to be his waist upward. Downward from what appeared to be his waist, I saw what looked like fire, giving a brilliant light all around him. This brilliance around him looked like a rainbow in a cloud on a rainy day. This is how the appearance of the glory of Adonai looked. When I saw it, I fell on my face, and I heard the voice of someone speaking. Quite a bit to absorb. I believe that this dome glittering like ice, and notice it doesn't say ice, it says glittering like ice. I believe that this dome is what is described in Revelation as the sea of glass. Here above this is a throne, and seated on this throne is what appeared to be a person, except that he's in a highly glorified state full of the Shekinah that will be the returned Messiah. Look at the description again, Ezekiel 1, 27. I saw what looked like gleaming amber-colored fire radiating from what appeared to be his waist upward. Downward from what appeared to be his waist, I saw what looked like fire, giving a brilliant light all around him. This brilliance all around him looked like a rainbow in a cloud on a rainy day. This is how the appearance of the glory of Adonai looked. When I saw it, I fell on my face, and I heard the voice of someone speaking. Now, let's compare this with where John is was taken. Let's go to Revelation 4, 1 through 6. After these things I looked, and there before me was a door standing open in heaven, and the voice like a trumpet which I had heard speaking with me before said, Come up here, I will show you what must happen after these things. Instantly I was in the Spirit, and there before me in heaven stood a throne, and on the throne someone was sitting. The one sitting there gleamed like diamonds and rubies, and a rainbow shining like an emerald encircled the throne. Surrounding the throne were twenty-four other thrones, and on the throne sat twenty-four elders dressed in white clothing and wearing gold crowns on their head. From the throne came forth lightnings, voices, and thunderings. Before the throne were seven flaming torches, which were the sevenfold Spirit of God. In front of the throne was what looked like a sea of glass, clear as a crystal. In the center around the throne were four living beings covered with eyes, front and behind. This does indeed seem to be the same place that was seen inside the cloud of Ezekiel, with the same person seated on the throne, and in front of the throne is what looked like a sea of glass, clear as crystal. The throne would be elevated above this. That's the nature of thrones to be elevated, above what seemed like a dome of ice. When we read all of Ezekiel chapter 1, we see a lot of references to fire. 
in the description of the one seated on the throne, in describing the Karavim, fire flashing here and there among them. And what does it say about the scene in Revelation 15.2? I saw what looked like a sea of glass mixed with fire. Those defeating the beast, its image and the number of its name were standing by the sea of glass holding harps which God had given them. Those who had defeated the beast and its image and the number of its name, that would be the saints, the chosen of God, who were standing near this sea or next to this sea of glass. The throne room in heaven that was seen in the cloud. Remember that the physical and the spiritual are now interfaced. The cloud that contains the throne of God is now down over Mount Zion. Remember, we looked at that. The the cloud that contains the throne of God is now down over Mount Zion. In so many words, it's physically on earth. And the saints are given harps and sing the song of Moses, servant of God and the servant of the Lamb. And the Lamb is standing on Mount Zion with a hundred and four. 44 first fruits. What are they doing? They're singing a new song that only they could sing. The harvest that follows, the first harvest, has now come in. And and what are they doing standing before the sea of glass above which is the throne? They're mirroring something that Exodus told us. They're mirroring something that Exodus has told it as Israel is leaving Egypt and moving towards the promised land. In Exodus 24, 29, it tells us that Moses, Aaron, Nadav, Avahu, and 70 elders went up and they saw the God of Israel. They went up on top of the mountain to where the cloud was down before them. So they saw the God of Israel, and look at this. Under his feet was something like a sapphire pavement as clear as the sky itself. There is that ice again, if you will. Where did these come up to the cloud sea? I believe they saw something that's going to be seen again and again and again at the end of the age. They saw this here in Revelation. And what are they doing? They're standing before the sea of glass in Revelation, which is above the throne, on which would be setting the glorified Messiah, who is about to unleash the final plagues of the God upon the remaining unrepentant world, like unto the end that Pharaoh and the unrepentant Egypt that followed him to the bitter end. As God's people went forward to be with himself, following the pillar of cloud, followed the cloud filled with fire so they could do this at night, out of which the word of God spoke to them, and they were singing a new song. What are the people singing here? Revelation 15, 2 through 4, please. I saw what looked like a sea of glass mixed with fire. Those defeating the beast, its image, and the number of its name were standing by the sea of glass holding harps, which God had given them. And they were singing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb. Great and wonderful are the things you have done, Adonai, God of heaven's army. I want you to think about that. That's much the same thing that Israel was singing as they came up out of the parted Red Sea before the God. Great and wonderful are the things you have done, Adonai, God of heaven's army. Just and true are your ways, King of the nations. Adonai, who will not fear and glorify your name? Because you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship before you, for your righteous deeds have been revealed. There was a song going around in the greater body of Messiah some 25, 35 years ago based on this passage. I wonder if any of you heard that. And they sang the song of Moses, 
the servant of the lamb. Da 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 da. Well, us old folks remember it. That's what these or those that were being harvested or taken into a safe place are doing. They're singing the praise of God. What about those that were gathered for the wine press? We haven't looked at the wine press in quite a little while. Let's look at Revelation 15, 5 through 8, please. After this, I looked, and the sanctuary, that is, the tent of witness in heaven, was opened. And out of the sanctuary came the seven angels with the seven plagues. They were dressed in clean, bright linen with gold and had gold belts around their chests. One of the four living beings gave the seven angels seven gold bowls filled with the fury of God who lives forever and ever. Then the sanctuary was filled with smoke, keep note of that, from God's Shekinah, that is, from his power, and no one could enter the sanctuary until the seven plagues of the seven angels had accomplished their purpose. This is the sanctuary in heaven that's being talked about being opened here, that's filled with smoke. Remember the four living beings? These are the Karavim. These are the angels that are described as the angels closest to the throne of God. From the time of the fall of man until now, they have been the only created beings to this be this close to God on his throne, with the possible exception of Enoch and Elijah, who were taken directly to God. Elijah, you remember, was taken up in a fiery chariot, which if you study that fiery chariot out, is the throne of God surrounded by the Kerovim. We looked at that way, way back. One of these closest of all the angels to the throne of God these four, carries out the seven bowls of God's fury and gives them to the angels who are to pour them out, seven angels who have come directly from the sanctuary of God itself, and by their clothing are being described as being in the highest state of purity. They were dressed in white with gold on their chests. Thus, being able to carry out the strongest of all God's judgment because of their being described in the state of highest purity. Anyone, any being, who was themselves impure would themselves succumb to the judgment that they were handed to pour out. Thus, these seven angels had to be of the highest purity, significant by the clean white garments they were wearing and the gold belts on their chest. Now then, Look at the reaction of God himself to the pouring out of this judgment. He becomes unapproachable during the time that this is being carried out, so great it is furies. So much for God being like Santa Claus for us. The full effect of God is turned to the completion of this task. It's, ne it's really never been possible to stand up to the full effect of God even when he was in what might be termed as a good mood. Let me give you a couple of examples. Go to Exodus 40, where Moses is putting the finishing touches on the tabernacle. Exodus 40, verse 33. Finally, he, Moses, created the tabernacle and the altar and set up the screen around the entrance to the courtyard. Then the cloud, <clears throat> the cloud covered the tent of meeting. Now, this is the same cloud, if you will, that we've been talking about that's come down over the Mount of Olives in the end of the age. The cloud covered the tent of meeting and the glory of Adonai filled the tabernacle. Moses was unable to enter the tent of meeting because the cloud remained on it and the glory of Adonai filled the tabernacle. Whenever the cloud was taken up from the tabernacle, the people of Israel continued on their travels. That was how they knew it was time to move forward. Next. But if the cloud was not taken up, they did not travel onward until the day the cloud was taken up. For the cloud of Adonai was above the tabernacle during the day, and the fire was in the cloud at night, so that all the house of Israel could see it throughout their travels. 
throughout all of Israel's travels, they were given this picture of this cloud full of fire that was above the tabernacle that moved ahead of them when they were supposed to travel and were looking at this same cloud again that's going to be the one that comes down on top of Mount of Olives by the temple as Messiah returns. Wow. Even Moses, who was privileged to go up on the mountain of God more than once, who at other times had been brought into close proximity with God, could not enter the sanctuary when God was there in his fullest. Let's go first Kings chapter 8, verse 10. When the Kohanim, the priest, came out of the holy place, the cloud filled the house of Adonai, so that because of the cloud, the Kohanim, the priest, could not stand up to perform their service for the glory of Adonai, filled the house of Adonai. This is a newly built temple of Solomon that this is talking about. And like the newly completed tabernacle of the desert, when God entered in his fullness, nobody of creation could go in there and be with him. Not even the priests to perform their required duties. These were both, the tabernacle in the desert and this first temple, just physical copies of the sanctuary in heaven, the one from which these angels have just walked out of that are going to pour out the seven plagues. A little aside, let's look at Isaiah's fear at coming into the presence of God in this kind of manner. Isaiah 6, 1 through 7. In the year of King Uzziah's death, I saw Adonai sitting on a high lofty throne. The hem of his robe filled the temple. Seraphim, that's an angel form, stood over him, each with six wings, two covering his face, two covering his feet, and two for flying. They were crying out to each other, More holy than the holiest holiness is Adonites of old. The whole earth is filled with his glory. The doorpost shook at the sound of their shouting, and the house was filled with smoke. Then I said, Woe to me, I too am doomed, because I, a man with unclean lips, living among a people with unclean lips, have seen with my own eyes the king at a night's of old. One of the seraphim flew to me with a glowing coal in his hands, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. He touched my mouth with it and said, Here, this has touched your lips, your iniquity is gone, your sin is atoned for. Smoke, or the cloud, filled the sanctuary, and old Isaiah knew he was doomed. He was in the presence of God as one forgiven, one atoned for. But the cold touched his lips. And so it was with these people in Revelation 15, 1 through 4, standing by the sea of glass with, mixed with fire. They were inside the cloud where the presence of Adonai is. For a couple more places of the movement of Adonai, the cloud, let's go to Ezekiel 10, 4. Adonai is in the process of leaving the temple, the most holy place here because of his anger and frustration with the people of Israel and what they're doing in that temple. So let's look at Ezekiel um, 10.4. The glory of Adonai rose from above the Kareev to the threshold of the house, leaving the house filled with the cloud and the courtyard full of the brilliance of Adonai's glory. The Kareev were above the ark of the covenant in the most holy place of the temple, and that's where resided God in his fullest when he was in the temple. And so the glory is rose, arose, and lifted up from above those kareev in that most holy place and moved to the threshold of the house, to the door of the temple, leaving the house, the temple, filled with the cloud and the courtyard full of the brilliance of his glory. The courtyard is where he's about to walk out of the cloud into. Wow. Then Ezekiel sees 
really a prophecy about the return of Adonai. Only Adonai can return to the most holy place in the temple in the form that we know that will be the form of the glorified Yeshua at the end of the age. Ezekiel 44, 5, please. And I said to me, human being, pay attention. See with your eyes and hear with your ears everything I tell you about all the regulations of Adonai's house and about all its Torah. Pay attention to who can enter the house and who must be excluded from the sanctuary. Notice back in Revelation 15.8 that the smoke from the Shekinah is being used to represent power. When the smoke increased, the power of the presence of God was increasing. When the smoke filled the sanctuaries to the point that no one could enter, it was a sign of the increasing presence of the power of God. There probably is no way to actually measure the absolute power of the presence of God, what it would be. Probably no way that we can do that. But we have a clue about how powerful he actually is. God's power is more than sufficient to keep a universe that we can't even measure yet in perfect, flawless operation. And we are looking here at God being the necessary power, bringing the necessary power to bear to cleanse his creation. Can you just imagine that, God bringing the necessary power to bear to cleanse his creation? Chapter 16 will be a massive outpouring of God's power when we get into that in two weeks. Moving to change the world and the universe as we know it. Now let's finish up tonight by looking at some things that we've been told in Scripture that are applicable. Speaking with Matthew 5.18, please. Yes, indeed, I tell you that until heaven and earth pass away, not so much as a yod or a stroke will pass from the Torah, not until everything that must happen has happened. All right. Has everything happened yet? Then nothing's changed. Now look at Second Peter chapter 3, verse 8. Moreover, dear friends, do not ignore this. With the Lord, one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years like one day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some people think of slowness. On the contrary, he is patient with you. For it is not his purpose that anyone should be destroyed, but that everyone should turn from his sins. However, the day of the Lord will come like a thief. On that day, the heavens will disappear with a roar, the elements will melt and disintegrate, and the earth and everything in it will be burned up. And then finally, Revelation 21, verse 1. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, where the old heaven and the old earth had passed away, and the sea was no longer here. Now it tells us the day of the Lord is as of a thousand years. We're looking about a day of the Lord that's a thousand years coming up. There's a thousand year rule of Messiah involved here before these events that culminate into eternity finally take place. But understand that the beginning of this change is taking place when the earth is cleansed at this time, when the fury of God's wine press is carried out. As we look back up to Revelation 14.10, God's fury is poured out undiluted. God's fury is poured out undiluted. The presence, the power of the presence of God raises to such a point that no one can enter the sanctuary until the seven plagues are fully poured out and have accomplished their purpose. The power of the presence of God raises to such a point that no one can enter the sanctuary until the seven plagues are fully poured out and have accomplished their purpose. But this time is limited to the carrying out of these plagues which we'll start on next time, chapter 16. That'll be in two weeks. Next Wednesday will be Yom Kippur, so we will not be here. 